Yeah, so I think uh, symmetric polynomials are so basic that many people just uh, invent them before actually reading about them. <laughs> For example, I think they appear first when you study quadratic equation in, uh, in school. I don't know, something like this. Then uh, you learn that uh, it is more convenient to, uh, so of course you can write the roots. Right, but uh, it is much more convenient to work without uh, somehow using the roots. For example, you can compute x1 square plus x2 square without actually writing down. Uh, you can, of course, take x1, put it here, x2 put here, then a lot of cancellation will happen, but it is much more clever to write it like this. Right? And then you know that by Viet theorem that x1, x2 equals b, and then x1 plus x2 equals minus a. So you plug this formula and you get that this is equal to a squared minus 2b. Okay, so, uh, and uh, you can, you notice that you can do similar things whenever uh, this expression is symmetric in x1 and x2. So that's pretty basic, but then uh, I think it gets more interesting when you try to do this, the same thing with, with three variables. For example, I want to compute x1 square plus x2 square plus x3 square in terms of uh, the coefficients of, uh, so if, let's say, x1, x2, x3 are the roots of x square plus a, x cubed plus a, x square plus b, x plus c. Ah, that's what I, it's a bit too far. That's okay. <laughs> so x1, x2, x3 are roots of this. Then uh, how do I compute this? Again, I can write down the uh, a complete square, and then I'm, I have to subtract x1, uh, x2, plus x2, x3, plus x1, x3, right? And again, I get a square minus 2b. So the formula is the same. Wow, I say. So um, this is the beginning, <laughs> the first observation that leads to the notion of symmetric polynomials. So the main principle of symmetric polynomials is that all identities between symmetric polynomials should not depend on the number of variables. A number of variables. Okay, but first, I, okay, so I mean, I hope it's clear from this uh, illustration. Now I want to define symmetric polynomials, so, so, we call, now it will be a little bit more boring because we will write some definition. So you have uh, a polynomial in uh, x1, xn, polynomial p in variables x1 up to xn is, is called symmetric. If, uh, like, P of, uh, when you take any permutation of indices, you 
it stays the same. For any, any uh, bijection sigma from the set of 1 up to n to itself. Yeah, I did it, but it doesn't work still. So, okay, so uh, we have this definition, and uh, first I want to. Um, so, here we, we fix a number of variables, but later we will uh, make more clear why, what do we mean that doesn't change and the doesn't depend on the number of variables. But first, let's work with the fixed number of variables. So, um, first thing you discover is that, uh, well, so the idea is to write this polynomial. And uh, let's collect, exp expand and, and collect the powers of t. We will get t power n minus what we will call E1 of x1 up to xn t n minus 1 plus E2 xn t power n minus 2 and so on. Right? And uh, Vieta theorem says that like these uh, guys here, they have quite simple form. So first is just the sum, the second is uh, the sum of all products, so this is the sum over all i less than j of xi, xj, and so on. So we uh, can write the general formula that if you take ek, then it is the summation over all choices of indices y, i1, i2, ik. So we have, I, we have k indices, k is here, and we, would, we should take the product. So these guys, uh, so notice that when uh, uh, we just, oh, we, we define it. So the last one, en, will be equal simply the product of all x's. And we just say that en plus 1 and so on are 0. Then uh, these are called the elementary symmetric polynomials. And the uh, um, first uh, theorem I want to, to prove is that theorem one is that every, every symmetric polynomial in uh, n variables has the, can be can be expressed in terms of the elementary polynomials. And in a unique way. OK? So more formally speaking, uh, there is a bijection between symmetric polynomials and polynomials in variables E1 and E2 and so on up to E. But I, I prefer this bit more intuitive uh, way of describing things. So, okay. Now let's, um, and the idea is, so the proof. So here I want to put some uh, 
hashtag. Like when you use Twitter, you uh, sort of you say something like, okay, this is true, and then you put hashtag, Grobner basis, hashtag, mass is cool, for example, and stuff, stuff like that. <laughs> so here I put, uh, so, It doesn't mean that I'm going to explain what the Grobner basis is, but if you want to learn how to use a similar technique in other settings, you should Google this phrase, and <laughs> it will give you an answer. So uh, the main idea, so main idea of the proof is to, the, the main idea is to take something called the main term. So whenever we have a symmetric polynomial, Let's take P is, uh, okay, no, naturally it is a sum of certain monomials, certain powers. Of, so it's a sum of some coefficients we have here, some coefficients, and then some uh, x1 power i1, x2 power i2, xn power in, right? And the idea of the main term is to take the biggest possible, the biggest in some way, a monomial from here, and then to kill it and to increase it, to, to increase this main term. So, so what is the main term? So what do we do? We, we, we take all this, uh, we list all the, so list all tuples I1, I2, IN, that appear in this summation. And then, uh, and order them, them, uh, in the reverse lexicographic order. First, uh, so first we list uh, all, um, list all of uh, highest total degree. The total degree is just the sum of the i's. And among them, we first look at the degree of x1, and we choose it to be the, the largest, and then the degree of x2, and so on. Then uh, sort by i1, then sort by i2, and so on. So, and the first one, the term, first term will be our main term. So the first term in the list is the main term. It's called the main term. So let's look how it looks like. It has x1, to some power i1, then x2, some power i2. But i2 must be smaller than i1, right? Because if I have i2 bigger, so, so i2 is smaller or equal than i1. Because otherwise I could just choose, uh, because I have i1, i2, and the thing is symmetric, I can, I also has term i2, i1. So this is clear, so, and so on. And, and in the end I will get a decreasing sequence non-strictly decreasing. So, uh, so I want to subtract the some product of elementary symmetric polynomials from my polynomial so that the main term will go down. I will uh, be smaller main term, and so in the end I will get uh, my um, 
by induction somehow, you, I get the, that my polynomial is an expression in terms of the elementary symmetric polynomials. And how do I do this? So I draw this picture where I have here I1, then I2, and so on. I get such a picture, some, a partition. And then I, uh, the trick is to take, to count boxes now in horizontal, uh, sorry, in vertical directions. I will get some indices J1, J2, J, K. And then I take uh, I, the elementary polynomial E, G, K times E, G, K minus one times so on up to G, G one. So the idea is that the, uh, for example, if I have only one box here, then I will be having X one Okay, let's just compute some example. Like this, so that I have x1 cube, x2 square. So I should take this box corresponds to give me e1. These two boxes, that's why I get e2. And these two more boxes, I have e2. So if I start writing these things down, then I'll have x1 plus something then E2 will give me X1, X2 plus something. And another E2 will give me X1, X2 plus something. So in this way, I cooked a product of elementary symmetric polynomials, which begins with X1 cube, X2 square, right? And I can always do it like this. So I subtract this product from my original polynomial, and I continue until I get zero. Come again? Would it be helpful to do an example? Do you want? <laughs> yes, I can do. <laughs> um, okay, why not? I mean, this is, should be basic after all. Okay, let's do the two the example, like x1 cube x2 square plus uh, x1 square. No, that would be too easy, right? Plus, for example, x1, x, um, okay, x1 square plus x2 square. So what does my rule say? First, I should take, I will get the box, uh, Sorry, like this, with two, two squares. So this will give me, I have to take E1 square, right? So I should take X1 plus X2 square and subtract it. So this way I have E1 square plus, what is left is uh, minus two X1, X2, right? So this was step one. I represented my polynomial as a, um, some elementary polynomial and then something else. And then on step two, I take again the main term. This is x1, x2. And this gives me this picture. And I am supposed to take uh, e2 because this is two. So E2 is just X1, X2 itself. So when I uh, continue, I don't have anything left. So that's how it. Okay, so. Uh, Now I should make my, the principle that I stated in the beginning more precise. So uh, 
the principle will say that how to somehow go between. Okay, let's take so the hashtag will be limits in algebra, not in topology. So the idea is that you have rings of n of symmetric polynomials in n variables for different n, and they should be somehow related. Right? So we have so let's say we take sim n is uh, sim symmetric polynomials in n variables. And uh, I should I have want to study them for different n, and they should be somehow related. So for example, if I, I can take sim n and sim n plus 1. The first thing, I, try, I can try to build uh, some maps between them. But for example, I want to, if I have a symmetric polynomial in n variables, maybe it is a symmetric polynomial in n plus 1 variable. But it is not true. For example, x1 square is a symmetric polynomial in one variable, but it is not symmetric polynomial in two variables. What I can do, I can take some symmetrization, but it's not, it's not cool. It doesn't commute with products and so on. So instead, I, I will construct a map in the opposite direction. And what I do is if I have a polynomial in n plus 1 variable, I can set the last variable equal to 0. And then it will be symmetric in the rest. Now this is symmetric in n variables. And this map is clearly uh, algebra homomorphism. So, I mean, if I had the sum here, then I get sum here. If it's product here, then it will go to a product. So this is algebra homomorphism. And um, right, so uh, what I want to say is that you should study identities between symmetric polynomials, which are true. So we are interested that in identities which hold in for all n. And it means that, for example, I have some identity. I can consider it uh, in n plus 1 variables. If I set the last variable equal to 0, it should give me the same identity, but uh, for n variables. I don't know. That's sort of the idea behind these uh, limits in algebra. So, so you, should, you want to have something like sim infinity, infinitely many variables. But it's not really infinity, because every identity will be finite. It will be some combination of letters. But uh, so under this map that I constructed, uh, remember the, the theorem says that this is generated by this elementary polynomials, and this is also. And uh, the map is just sends e n plus one to zero. So n plus 1 goes to 0. Sort of, if you have something formal, you just kill all n plus 1s, and that's how it works. So cool. Now we have this symmetric, this uh, polynomials, but we cannot do anything with them because there is no relations between these ones. So that's why we need some other polynomials. And uh, uh, motivation is like this. For example, uh, I don't know, uh, this polynomial in two variables
is clearly symmetric, yes? So I should be able to express a, if you have a formula of, like this polynomial can be computed in terms of this E1, E2, and so on, right? And um, so that's why I introduce this. So uh, in different symmetric polynomials, generalize this. So Hn, by definition, is a sum of all monomials in uh, these variables, sorry, this should be different, k, say, k is the sum of all monomials in xk of total degree k, xn, sorry. Because this one is is clearly the one of this. So first question is how to relate H and uh, so this and E. So these are called complete, uh, complete homogeneous so. symmetric polynomials. Ah yes, and then there is another one. I can take this. I can just take something simple, like prod sum of case powers of, of my variables. This is called power sum. So there should be a relation uh, between these three and the two to find this relation, relations, uh, it is very um, convenient to use generating functions. So the first generating function is easy. Uh, it will be for the polynomials, for the elementary polynomials. And remember the definition that I obtained my elementary symmetric polynomials if I open the brackets in this expression. So remember this. It is more convenient to work with slightly different object. I divide everything by t power n and replace t by one over t. I mean, I. Instead of this, I can write this. I mean, it's quite easy to see that this is uh, simply when you open brackets in this expression, you'll get the same thing. It will start with one, then I'll have e1t plus e2t squared, and so on. But a uh, good thing about this expression is that I can somehow write uh, uh, that I, it somehow works for any number of variables, right? I mean, I can, so I can pretend that this formula holds. The product of all one minus t x i is one minus e one of them t plus e two of this times t square minus e three, and so on. Okay, you may ask, okay, what if this product, the product does not converge? But in algebra, we don't care if product converges or not because each term can be computed from uh, just uh, on the level of symbols. You know, if I, if I want to compute, for example, co coefficient in front of t square, I know that I should, ex I should take all possible products of xi and xj where they are different. So... Uh, when I do this generating function business, I don't really care if the series converges or not. I just, it is just a series. Okay, and then uh, I want to do something else. I want to find the relation with H, with a complete homogeneous symmetric polynomial. And so how do you build any complete homogeneous symmetric polynomial? Like, where is the definition? Here. 
I have to have all monomials of total degree k. It means that I can take just all monomials, all possible monomials, and then sort them by the degree. And it will give me a sum of all hk's. So this uh, combinatorics is written very beautifully by this generating series. Okay, I will omit axis. X, H1 is a, actually a polynomial of axis, uh, so and so. And so on. Right? Why is this true? If this is true because if I write one uh, component in this product, it will be one plus t x one plus t square x1 square and so on. And you see that it has contains all monomials of x1. Then if I do, when I go to x2, I will get all monomials of x2. And so on. And when I open all these brackets in this infinite product, I will just get all monomials. And in front of each monomial, the power of t will be the same as the total degree of this monomial. So this formula holds. But this simple combinatorial principle shows, gives the proof of uh, non-trivial identity that if I take this expression and this expression, the product of them will be one. So this implies that one plus h one t plus h two t square and so on times one minus a e one t plus e two t square and so on is one. So let us find the term in front of t power k. So in front of t power k, I have hk minus hk minus 1 e1 plus hk minus 2 e2 and so on. And then it ends with minus 1 power k ek. This is 0. Because on the right hand side, I don't have any term uh, in front of t power k when k is greater than 0. And you see, this is very nice. We can compute hk always from uh, by induction. hk if I know ek or the other way around. I can express ek in terms of hk. And now, uh, there is another principle. So this is identity number two. Uh, here I want to obtain the power sum symmetric polynomials. This is for uh, power sum. So uh, I have this expression. This is a power series. I can take the logarithm of it. So what will I get? I, so we know that 1 plus h1 t plus h2 t square and so on equals to this infinite product. Or you, you know, you can say that if you have finite, finite number of variables, it is a finite product. So remember, we don't care about how many variables we have. So let's take the logarithm of both sides. The logarithm of a product is the sum of logarithms. And then I have log of 1 over 1 minus txi. And uh, there is a power series expression for that, which is I still have sum over i. And then I put sum over j. t, j now is from 1 to infinity, t x i power j over j. And now I exchange the summation and then I have the sum over j, t power j. 
divided by 1 over j. And then what is left here is exactly the power sum, the sum of powers of variables, j. So uh, it is more uh, natural and more custom, customary to write it, this expression in the following way. Uh, instead of log of this, I write exponential. And here I start with uh, 1, and this is p1 t plus p2 t squared divided by 2 plus p3 t cubed divided by 3, and so on. Um, okay, cool. Sometimes it is uh, kind of nice to have an expression. So this, uh, from here we can obtain um, kind of not so complicated expression of H in terms of P. Uh, but I mean, it is a little bit, it just has to, you know, take the exponential of the sum as a um, product of exponentials and then write the, form, the power series for the exponential and then I will have some kind of And then it will be some product of factorials. But, uh, okay, let's not go into this, but uh, factorials and powers of some, some integer numbers. Some integer numbers. And uh, uh, let us, so here is the thing. So um, I, I denote by lambda this sequence of integers such that uh, they are non-increasing. And I also write, denote this, just the product of And then I denote this number by m lambda. And then I have sum of p lambda over m lambda. That is uh, a convenient way to have it written where summation is over lambda. So this I denote as a sum of uh, indices. And uh, lambdas should be such that the size o is uh, k. OK. But these numbers will be important later, if I get to this point. So um, right, after we have this. Uh, we have, okay, we have H, we have E, and we have P. The three, fam three different families of symmetric polynomials. Cool. Now, what do I want to do? Um, so, uh, there is, um, uh, this, um, some, what we call involution. So this is some operation on uh, symmetric polynomials, which, uh, which when you apply it twice, you get the same thing you started with. 
let's call it uh, sigma. And it is defined like this. So whenever I have uh, I see a complete symmetric polynomial, I replace it by minus 1 power n times elementary symmetric polynomial. And whenever I see elementary, I take minus 1 power n times a complete one. OK? And now let's try to just uh, do this operation and see what it does to, to these different identities. Um, all right. So uh, the thing is that, sorry, I'm not allowed to do this operation because HNs are actually some combinations of ENs. So first, let's just to put it like this. And then let's look at this formula. And it, we see that in this formula, if I put so how do I, uh, so suppose I know the H polynomials and I want to find the E polynomials in terms of H. I have to write this series here and take inverse of it. Now I replace each HI by minus one power I EI. So I will get this thing. So when I take the inverse of it, I get this. So if I, my involution sends H and to this, then it will send uh, uh, this e elementary ones to the complete ones. So from here, you see that if you apply it twice, then it is identity. And then what does it do to the power sums? Now we should look at this formula. So what happens when we put HIs to replace HIs with EIs? I get here on the left-hand side, I get 1 divided by this, but what I had before. So it means that I, can, I will obtain the correct result if I replace this, what I have in the exponential, I put a minus in front of everything. This gives a proof that if I apply this involution to Pn, I will get minus Pn. And this is very cool because, you know, you have some complicated identity between symmetric polynomials. You apply this involution, you get a new identity. <laughs> so, uh, next, when, what people do after they have this symmetric, uh, these ones, H, E, and P. They introduce um, a scalar product on symmetric polynomials. So let's, there is a scalar product. For, to define this scalar product, we first should uh, introduce uh, some other symmetric polynomials, the monomial symmetric polynomials. And they defined like this. Uh, uh, for every lambda like, uh, like before, so it is non-increasing sequence, I can take uh, x1 power lambda 1 and so on, x, sorry, um, xm over lambda m, and then I take all permutations. of these guys and add them up. In this way, I obtain some, uh, another family of symmetric polynomials. <laughs> but they needed from, I needed them because I want to define the scalar product. And the scalar product, by definition, will be that if I have, uh, so, yeah, but what? 
Oh, di distinct permutations, yes. Sorry, maybe distinct. So, scalar product uh, will, if I have H lambda and so I define it for when I have a complete symmetric polynomial. So this is the product. And the mu is another sequence. Then this is uh, one if lambda equals to mu and zero otherwise. Okay, very simple definition. And so I have this color product, but I don't know why is it good? I mean, why should I care about this color product? But one thing I can do, I first I can compute some uh, scalar products of other, in other bases. <laughs> well, I gave you the idea, so you should work it out. <laughs> yeah, they are all bases, the H and the, the. Well. Okay, so um, for the proof of different identities involving a scalar product, I need the idea of, uh, I think it's called reproducing kernels. So this is a principle. So whenever we have a scalar product, let's say we have some space of, V is a space of polynomials. Some say, I don't know, finite or infinite dimensional space of polynomials in, uh, I don't know, x1, xn. Okay, and for every two, like f and j in, in the space, I can have this scalar product. Uh, fj is defined, and so it, it is some kind of, it is a, a scalar product. Meaning it is just bilinear. And suppose it is non-degenerate. What does it mean the non-degenerate? It means that if I have a basis. Sorry, I can't hear you. The thing is that my scalar product is, uh, yeah, I need to know that M's are bases. So it is horrible if I have any two symmetric polynomials, I have to express the first one in terms of H and the second one in terms of M. And then use this definition to compute my scalar product. So, yes. Sorry, yeah. okay. So, if I have a basis, Now, uh, it makes sense to speak, uh, uh, if it is a non-degenerate symmetric, uh, non-degenerate scalar product, I can find a dual basis. So there exists a dual basis. Uh, and what is a dual basis? It means that the scalar product of GI and FJ for any i and j is zero if i is not j and one otherwise. So uh, from this point of view, my definition says that let the scalar product be such that complete and monomial polynomials form a dual, uh, a dual to each other. 
Uh, the, now, what is the reproducing kernel principle? The reproducing kernel principle says that if I write, write the following thing, I take f1 of this x, and now I, I, I use different variables, y1 and up to yn, and I put g1 in this different set of variables. And then uh, I sum overall pairs like this. So this will be now in two sets of variables. Sum. sum, sorry. Uh, K of x, y. So the principle says this k does not depend on the choice of basis. Doesn't depend on the choice of basis. Now, this is um, some kind of triviality, in fact. I mean, it, is, it looks complicated, but it is not. Because, I mean, I have this k in two variables, I can expand it uh, to this k, I, there is some associated map. So for any, I don't know, psi, I take uh, k, x, y, and then pair it with psi using this color product. So expand it as a sum, sum of, of monomials, and each monomial in Y compute the scalar product with Psi, and you get polynomial in X. So it's some kind of contraction operation. Yeah. So this, now if K is a reproducing kernel, if K is like here, this map, from psi to this complicated contraction is just the identity map. So uh, now you have to use the pairing, scalar product is non-degenerate to show that if uh, k does, if this, so this map is the identity map, so it doesn't depend on the choice of any basis. So if I choose another one, then I mean, this, uh, there is some work to be done. But OK. So now let's employ this idea. So let's compute the uh, reproducing kernel of this scalar product. So I have to use definition. By definition, I should take the sum over uh, my uh, sets like this. And then I should take H, the complete of x, one of x variables. and then the monomial of others. OK, how do I compute such a thing? So uh, maybe first we should guess the answer and then uh, see that it, hold, it, it is true. So write this, the answer. The answer is like this. I have to take a product over all pairs i and j, 1 divided by 1 minus xi yj. So 
So now, uh, like, how do you can you possibly see that this this is equal? For this, you should ask yourself what stands in front of a monomial of a given monomial in Y. So what, which polynomial in X occurs in front of Y one power, I don't know, the one. So, uh, so first, where can y1 come from? y1 comes from the product y1 x1 y1 x2 and so on y one minus uh, one minus y1 x n. That's and that's the only way how y1 can appear. Right, so this is all pairs. So first I have product for, for y1, I have this, and the same for y2, the same for y3, and so on. And now we can use uh, our identity for the generating series of complete homogeneous symmetric polynomials to see that the coefficient in front of y1 power, so the coefficient in front of uh, y1 power lambda 1 is exactly h lambda 1 of axis by this by that identity that we had for the complete homogeneous symmetric polynomials and then the same happens for y2 for y3 and so on so in front of this monomial we'll have h lambda and that's why this identity is true Okay, now uh, I'm almost finished, I think. Five, okay. So now let's try to use this principle because I mean, this is how you will see the power of the principle. Let's write, uh, expand, this in, this, the, in, expand this product in some other way, All right? So how can we do it? Let's take uh, the uh, logarithm of that. So let's expand uh, our reproducing kernel in a different way. Uh, so I want to write um, exponential of the logarithm of that. And the logarithm formula we already had, it must be, so it will be the sum of i and j they are indexing my variables, and then the sum over m, and then it will be x i y j uh, power m or divided by m. Yes, I have uh, for each i and j, I have this formula for the logarithm, and that's how it works. And now let's exchange information. Uh, now um, I have one over m, and here I have some sum over all i and some over all all j. So uh, let me. How do you put it better? It means that I have a power sum symmetric polynomial. But evaluated at all products, x1, y1, x1, y2, x2, y1, um, y1, and so on. All of them, all pairs. Okay, but 
you remember I, I, I said let's, um, so now this, this part here looks, looks like what I, we had before. Because we, com we, we had that, we say, the, uh, we assume that the exponential of, uh, of this thing is simply the sum over all sequences. And then I have P lambda, the product of power sums, divided by M lambda. Some multiplicity, some integer number, which is the product of some factorial sum. But this now is evaluated at all pairs. But now it is not hard to see that when you have, whenever you have this power sum symmetric function and you have all pairs, it is the same as the product of power sums. So I get the sum lambda of x and the same p lambda of y divided by m lambda. So from here you see that, uh, so what is the dual basis to p basis? So this basis then must be dual to the basis yes. therefore uh, a product of different uh, scalar product uh, of two different power sum symmetric functions can be is, is zero if lambda is not mu and it is m lambda if lambda equals So, uh, right, I don't have time. Yeah, this is a pity. So we have um, the way to, comp uh, you see that P lambda is almost like the orthogonal, an orthogonal basis, which is very nice to have for a scalar product. And um, in fact, uh, like my experience shows that doing some tedious computations, it is always easier to work with power sum symmetric functions. But the problem with them is that um, they're not very nice. For example, all, uh, if you have a symmetric function with integer coefficients, then it will be st still have integer coefficients if you expand it with respect to elementary symmetric functions or monomial symmetric functions or complete homogeneous symmetric functions. But for this, power sum symmetric functions will have some denominators. So for computations, it's a very good basis, but for uh, like some insights and geometry, it's not very good. And then there is another basis, uh, which is the most interesting one. It is uh, both orthogonal and integer. So that everything, every symmetric function has integer coefficients with respect to this basis. And it's a sure, so there is this Sure basis, and uh, then like uh, you have lots of interesting identities with uh, determinants, and they are, they are defined as using some kind of generalized van der Monde determinants, and they are not very easy, but they are very nice. <laughs> Sorry. That's I have to stop here. Unfortunately, I didn't have any time for examples. <laughs>